I'm Ayu Kazatak. I come from Ungalashlik, also known as Yun Maklit. I'm the granddaughter of Stanton and Irene Kitschtag, the daughter of Doug and Bernita Herdman, and mama to four amazing kids, the Tulchok, the Laluk, Knigluk, and Inuatluro. And I currently serve as vice president for First Alaskans Institute. I'll kick it over to you, Flada Dafna. Dan Hazun, I'm Angela Gonzalez. Flada Dafna is my Danaka name. I'm from Huslia, which is northwest of Fairbanks, and I live and work in Dena'ina land here in Anchorage area. I'm so happy to be here. I work in the Alaska Native Policy Center at First Alaskans Institute as the Indigenous Communications Manager. I'm really looking forward to the program today. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second in a series of six webinars for First Alaskans Institute and Museums Alaska. The collabo. <laughs> this webinar is going to be focused on being good relatives, building good relationships and trust between uh, the Native community and the museums of Alaska. We're really happy to be here with all of you. We're thrilled to be able to share the voices of some of our friends and family that can help us think thoughtfully and critically about the nature of relationships between museums and Native communities and how we can be better relatives. So on behalf of First Alaskans Institute um, and our team, we welcome you to the webinar. We're so glad that you're here and we look forward to the conversation. I'd like to invite Dixie to come and share from Museums Alaska what your um, what your hopes are for opening up this kind of dialogue, how we can grow together, and what we intend to do moving forward from here. Wonderful, thank you. Um, hello everyone, my name is Dixie Clough. Uh, I'm the director of Museums Alaska, which is the statewide museum association here in Alaska. Um, I began my position last April and moved to the state last May. So I moved here from Florida, but I mostly grew up in Maryland, right outside of DC. Uh, just a little bit about me. Uh, when I started this position, I wanted to get a feel for what museums might need from us. So I spoke to several board members and museum colleagues across Alaska, and I heard many times that uh, fostering meaningful relationships with uh, local Alaska tribes and indigenous people was something that a lot of museums really wanted to do, but maybe didn't know how to start or how to build on the relationships they already had begun starting. Um, so we at Museums Alaska, we're very interested in creating a program that would help build these relationships and keep them going into the future. Um, but we also knew that we could not do it alone. Uh, <laughs> I was blunt in the last webinar, so if you watch that on YouTube, you'll see too, I'll be blunt again. I am a white woman and I moved here to Alaska last year. I am absolutely not the person to lead these conversations. Um, I know about museum practice, but I can't speak to the experiences that Alaska Native visitors have had when visiting museums or the experiences um, individuals and tribes have had when working with or at museums. But I knew that there was an organization here in Alaska that could help us bridge that gap in knowledge. So at the top of our list of potential partners was First Alaskans Institute. Um, and so we were really hoping that we could really build a relationship with them and start creating programs together. Um, and right when we were planning to reach out and begin talking about a program like this, we actually heard that IMLS had given ARPA funds to Alaska State Library, and they were so generous and decided to share it with the museum community. Um, and we knew that this opportunity, this program could be a great fit for that grant program. So we reached out to First Alaskans and, um, said, hey, there's this funding, could you do a program with us? And they were amazing. They jumped right in. <laughs> they were up for the challenge. Um, and so we've been working on this program since last year. And it's just come together so beautifully. I'm so impressed with the thoughtfulness that First Alaskans has um, put into the program's details. Um, I know that if you watched last week's webinar, you probably um, 
got as much from it as I did, maybe even more. I know that everyone picks up little things that are different in each um, from each speaker. And I know that we're going to do the same over and over. And I'm sure if I watch it again, which I will, and I hope you guys do too, when it goes on YouTube channels, you're going to see even more things that you're going to be able to pull out and maybe help improve the practices at your institutions. Um, so I know this is, as we've said, this is the second webinar of a six webinar series, but we also know that this is a long-term project. So we in no way think that these six webinars are going to be the end of building these relationships and growing and learning how museums can do better and create these relationships and build on them. So I really hope that we can continue our partnership with First Alaskans and continue to uh, put out resources and information that help museums kind of reflect on what we've done in the past, what we're doing now and how we can improve in the future. So I look forward to learning more uh, from the amazing speakers in this webinar and from our future webinars. And I know that everyone else is as well. So I am going to go ahead and stop talking now and let FAI and our amazing speakers take over. Uh, thank you, Dixie. I really appreciate that. As you were speaking, I was, um, I had quite a few thoughts run through my mind, um, but one of them was, you know, something that we'll hear from time to time doing the kind of work that we do is folks who feel a level of frustration um, when it comes to learning true history. That's, you know, sometimes both painful and hard to learn about and reckon with um, and a sentiment of, you know, that's in the past, you know, we need to move forward. But the, the image that came to my mind as, as that floated to the surface was of our Ohana down in Hawaii talking about um, wayfaring, right? So voyaging on their, their vacas, their canoes, and how so many of them voyage by looking behind them, right? They know what direction they need to go by looking behind them. And so the more that we have a shared understanding of our history, the more that we can put our good thinking together around how we move forward together in a good way. And so I really value and appreciate the space that's being created for these real conversations. And I have a lot of hope for what that will mean for the future of museums in Alaska. So Thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, a thought, a memory rose to my mind this morning when I was coming in, getting ready for this, this conversation. And that was of my funnick. My only daughter, a few years ago, she was preparing with her classmates to go to the local museum. And she knew that they were going to be learning about Alaska Native people in this space. And recognizing that very little is taught in our schools about Native people, um, she was feeling a level of anxiety about going to the museum and what they were going to say and how they were going to talk about us. And it was especially hard because I couldn't go with her. I usually get to chaperone um, field trips and I can kind of help smooth the way, um, but I wasn't able to make this one. And she was actually crying to me the morning of her field trip. And she was really feeling nervous and worried about what they would say about Native people and also feeling anxious about how they would turn to her to be the expert, to be the one to affirm or correct what was being taught and feeling unprepared for that as well. She was in second grade. I'd never had a conversation with my kids about the history of museums. We've never had a conversation about um, the past in that way. That was coming purely from her lived experience of knowing that so often when histories of Native people are shared, 
they're shared from perspectives that are not our own. And you can feel that othering in these spaces. And I was really reflecting on that memory this morning. It just came to the surface so strongly. And thinking about the opportunity that's before us, that a museum space that is intended to be a living and breathing space of learning together can be one where everyone feels a sense of belonging and everyone feels seen and valued and can access the knowledge that's contained within, you know? So I'm really excited for our conversation together. I want to acknowledge that having these conversations can be difficult, you know? We wanna lean into our agreements. We want you to take care of yourself, stay hydrated, <laughs> stretch, grab some food so you don't get hangry, whatever you need to do to take care of yourself. Because as hard as it is to have conversations and sometimes be confronted with difficult truths, it's so much harder to not be able to talk about it. It's so much harder for hurtful things to be hidden or even denied. Together, we can have real conversations about the truths. And we can do it in a good way that helps us think together about how we want to do better together. So that's the spirit that we're putting into this space. We're really thankful for each of you coming and engaging in this conversation with us. We hope that it provides good food for thought, continued food for thought in the ways that we can work together. We hope it helps um, bring some connections for you. We've invited some really incredible people, brilliant beings who have such strong hearts and strong minds. And if you're not already connected with them, we're really excited to get to introduce them to you. So I will hand it over to Father Daphne, who's going to bring in our guest speakers. Today, we're going to be talking about the Native community engagement and trust building. So that's the topic of our webinar. And we have some amazing guests, Nadia, Jackie, Asia, and Joel. Please give uh, them a welcome, and um, I will ask each of you to introduce yourselves. And then also, if you could please share the nature of your relationship with museums. Um, we can start with Nadia, and then um, Jackie, Joel, and then Asia. Wonderful. Uh, to my everybody, it's my great pleasure to be here with you today. And I'm really honored to be part of this conversation. And I think we're talking about something that is very uh, dear to my heart and something that I think about almost daily, how Alaska Native people are represented and why museums matter. So my name is Nadia Jakinski Sati, and I live on the shores of Kachemak Bay, which is not far from Homer. And I am Alutik Sukbiat. I'm a member of the Nanilchik tribe. I'm a daughter of fishermen. I'm a mama of three little girls, and I'm trained as an art historian. Um, I'm somebody who believes very strongly that the arts um, carry the spirit of our people and that they, the arts have the power to connect us across geographic boundaries and across time periods and across cultures. And I think they help us think really deeply and beautifully about who we are and where we come from. And uh, my work over the last decade and a half and a half or so has been focused on studying and documenting and trying to support Alaska Native artists and arts. Mm -hmm. Some of that through community-based research, some of that through working in museums as a curator, as a curatorial consultant, or as a member of advisory boards for museums. And right now I am working as a program director at the Siri Foundation, which is an Alaska Native nonprofit based in Anchorage. Um, and we get to oversee a program that is called Journey to What Matters, Increased Alaska Native Art and Culture. And with that program, we get to fund art making programs around the state 
And we have an initiative that we're currently working on that we call Alaska Native Museum Sovereignty. And I hope that's something I can share a little bit more about today. And I can also put um, in our chat box um, some more details about what museum sovereignty is. Uh, but basically it's this concept that Alaska Native people have the right to access collections and that we have the right to be able to control the narrative about how our material belongings are cared for and how they are interpreted within museum spaces. And through this program, we get to fund museum fellowships and we get to fund opportunities for Alaska Native artists to visit museum collections in person. And we also get to have conversations with Alaska Native people who are involved in uh, museum work to try to deepen and uh, understand how museums matter and why they matter and what we can do to make changes. So I'm really happy to be here again today and I look forward to this discussion. Okay, Jackie. Queen uh, Jacqueline Nali Gudak Cleveland Darunga, you Bugo, Queen Hachmim will lose you. Um, Darren Reifest, Hunga, Sulist, Mulosu. So, my name is Jacqueline Nali Gudak Cleveland. I'm you big from Queen Hawk. I'm a photographer, videographer, and um, I would say subsistence hunter fisher gatherer. And I'm involved in our, um, I feel like saying now famous museum of Nunaslach, which is the Gwynhawk Cultural Museum. And I'm a co-chair for the Gwynhawk Heritage Inc, which the museum falls under. I've um, documented um, through photos, video, interviewing various different um, voices, I guess, from our elders, especially when they're identifying artifacts, is how I first started the camera work with um, Nunasuk, which means old village, by the way, and it's our archaeological site um, on the coast here. Um, I've also volunteered <clears throat> both through all the camera work and also from digging, or I also dug, volunteer dug, I guess, and there, I just want to say, I'm really proud I found an arrowhead and a ulok handle, amongst other things. But those were my two most prized finds, I'd say. Um, I've been involved in workshops, both as a participant and documenting the process. Um, and I see some people here from, from some of the workshops. Good to see you all. Um, uh, some of the workshops include grass twining, um, fish, making fish leather, drum, traditional drum making and harpoon making are happening now. And um, I actually co-authored an article that will come out in the Inuit magazine. And then most recently joined the dance group, um, the Gwynhaq Yupik dance group who practices in the museum. And those are my connections with museum, the museum here. Thanks. Anna Basset, uh, Joel, and then Asia. Uh, yeah, we do. Fedora Counter Pennington Shichita, Sharon Isaac Shunta, David Isaac Stupta, Lakayas Deni Inesh Iji, Kinai or Katnu Shaku Shakaya Kailanda, Deni Ina Ashlanshit. Um, Hi everyone, my name is Joel Isaac. My Dena'ina name is Lakayis. My grandmother was Fedora Calendar Pennington. She was originally from Point Possession right across the water from Anchorage. And um, part of the work that I do is I work for the state of Alaska as the director for tribal affairs for the Department of Education and Early Development. I also have an art practice um, that I is originally what I went to school for and do a lot of installation art and also working in traditional um, arts as well. And I think for me, the, the question about realizing museums need to grow is my kind of uh, entrance into the museum world was actually a pretty positive one when it came to me working as a visual artist. Um, and it made me think back when I had some of my first like not pleasant experiences working in art with art historian folks and museums um, 
that my experience in school as a youth, as a student, um, when I was younger, the museums definitely did not represent what I was interested in. Um, I did a lot of extra work to bring my, like what I was interested in learning about and really utilizing the museum for that. But I also had some pretty formal Western training, even from a very young age of how to like use a library, how to like go through and do that kind of Western academic study is something that I've always been pretty nerdy at. And so for me, that was one of those obstacles that I had removed through work in like second grade was that when that started. Um, so that was one of those pieces that I know is, is challenging for a lot of people, uh, especially for native folks who've never had a chance to interface with that. And really what helped me go beyond just being a, I bought a pass to the museum and I'm looking at stuff that's on the wall and reading a catalog was an invitation through the Museum of the North to go and I, so I can't remember who it was. It might be someone on the Zoom, um, did a presentation at UAF for one of the uh, Alaska Native Center or Art Center um, had a guest lecturer come in and they were talking about go and research at museums. And I was like, what, you can do that? That was the piece that I'd never known you could do. And then I went to the Museum of the North and that was the first time I was able to actually handle fish skin objects. And so I had a really good supportive connection into a museum wanting to have that exchange. Um, that's not been the case for every museum, um, that's for sure. But that, that need to grow, um, I think that's part of the outreach that Native people don't know how to access museum collections. And the other piece about it is, um, and this is some of the work that I'm doing with Nadia on writing for the project that she described, is bringing elders into those spaces. And that's like me as an independent male artist who has an MFA, I have a pretty decent shot at getting in to museums to, and then when I'm wanting to bring elders with me who are going to pick up and handle objects like they do in their homes, because these are the stuff that we live with, that can terrify <laughs> conservationists and curators because it's like, don't touch the objects, don't pull on that, don't like, don't beat the literal drum. All those things that go into it, that's actually how these objects are supposed to be cared for. And the other piece, I think, that really comes into it is um, were that my experience with the elders who have trained me, who I've apprenticed with and mentored with, they're making something that hasn't been made in like 50 or 60 years or like 150 years. And we're making these highly collectible museum objects is what they're called. Like people like, oh, what museum is that for? And that's how they've made money for their lives is privileging these one of a kind previous day-to-day -day objects into museum collections and then they never see them again. And part of my role that I feel like for me as an artist with those elders that I work with is being able to bridge that gap so that they can go see the objects that they've made that are now locked in the vault. And they're really proud and I'm really proud that their work is in the museum, but that's part of that. How do we still live with those objects? Because we, we don't always have them at our home still and we really should. And that's, that's part of the work that I think museums also have is the how to provide access to the, these one of a kind, really unique historical marvels that really are our day-to-day -day life. And how do we get that back into our day-to-day -day lives so that it's not the, the one thing that's been made every 50 or 150 years moving forward. So I'm gonna pause there. That's just a, a few kind of series of experiences for like, huh, it's not, it wasn't just like a, a moment of like, oh, museums need to change. It, it was, a, it's a series of experiences that kind of are like, 
huh, yeah, no, that's not a perfect situation, or there's definitely room for improvement on some, some of these things. And about that, Asia? Good morning, and it's a really a privilege to be here. Thank you for including me and um, to together with all of you is uh, an experience I, I primarily view as one of learning, but I'm, I'm willing to share that uh, I, um, I'm a woman who was born in Mexico and raised in Alaska to settler parents of mixed European and Asian origin who came here um, around 1969 to fish and to paint. Um, and um, I grew up wild crafting and, and commercial fishing and living um, on the shores of Ketchumac Bay on the Nilchik tribal land, um, largely very, um, very grateful and happy to live here and be a part, um, even as a child of a community museum experience that I felt uh, was, um, fairly positive um, in terms of engaging community around potlucks and conversations and exhibitions. And as I grew up, I later got my MFA and returned to Homer to help um, grow a nonprofit art center in what was um, formerly a, a trading post uh, building here, the Inlet Trading Post um, at To Get which is the original Dene'ina name, meaning at the shore here on Ketchumac Bay. I'm, I started to really begin to see that um, the story of the people of this place, those who settled here, but much more those who have stewarded this place since time immemorial, it's really um, not understood and widely shared um, locally. And there is a lot of work to be done. Really, um, certain mentors had a profound impact on me. Um, my parents, uh, who were very well read, um, my mother as a radio producer traveled around Alaska um, gathering stories of transition and change in a program called the People Speak funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities in the 70s and 80s. And I heard a lot of very important indigenous elders talk um, through poetry, dance, um, story, song, um, interviews about um, trauma and um, tremendous amount of abuse through the conquest of Alaska. Um, then I went to college and went to Yale and I started to really think about museums in a much more critical way, partly because of, you know, the intention of the education to um, sort of build voices of um, critical thinking and um, post structural thinking. Um, and when I returned back to Homer to help build this art center. Um, I was very fortunate that Ron Sanungatuk, the Nupiak elder and teacher who established the Native Art Study Center in Fairbanks moved to Homer and kind of um, in a way took me under wing um, to talk about um, artists and opportunities that um, exist in Alaska today that deserved um, much more um, acknowledgement and um, discussion through exhibitions. And so about 10 years ago, I started to focus on um, decolonizing practices within um, exhibition building and relationship building with artists. And through um, touring exhibitions that um, uh, forefront um, methods of decolonization and artistic practice and especially uh, indigenous artist practice. And so um, today I'm, I'm just in, seeing myself as a student primarily and a steward to help support um, this very, very um, vulnerable and really um, important time where we can think about and support museums in moving forward. And it's, it's, it's 
the hard work because the fundamental thing is that we have to build in and lead system change that puts in place in the positions that we may have as non-Native individuals, leaders who are Indigenous. And back to each of you for introducing yourself and, and helping orient all of us to the, pers the perspectives that you're bringing into this conversation. I know that really, um, that was just the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> Each of you has such rich and varied experience and expertise. And so I just want to honor that. Um, and also, it is an interesting dichotomy that we're, we're engaging in these conversations. Um, I want to acknowledge that, you know, each of us have different perspectives and are looking at this topic of how museums can be in better relationship with Native peoples from different angles and different perspectives. And that will help us to have a more rich understanding of the overarching issue. Um, I want to lean into what Clickius Joel was, was just kind of opening up conversation around talking about experiences of coming to realize how much work we have to do as museums when it comes to building better relationships with Native people. I know each of us has uh, varied experiences with coming into that understanding, and I just want to open up some space for that. I'll kick us off and then um, see whoever would like to go next. Mine is a, a brief experience, um, actually situated within the pandemic. I think it was last year. No, it might have been the, the fall, winter of 2020, now that I think about it. Um, Kunak, Marjorie Tabon, was offering a series of Zoom workshops to carve a kunak, a sea loyal lamp. And she was offering it specifically to Indigenous women, Inupiaq, Yupik, Sikhpiaq women, uh, because this is a practice of our people, right? The seal oil lamp was so central to our lives and helping us to run our homes, et cetera. And so it's an awakening practice that's coming back. And so she offered these workshops where she mailed us um, little block of soapstone and all the little tools that we needed to be able to carve our kulik together, our nanit. And it was so incredibly beautiful. We did it in two or three sessions. I can't remember, but we would just sit in community with each other, kind of like we are right now. And we would be working on our kulik at the same time. And kunak was sharing images of different ones that she's seen, um, speaking to the knowledge of why, why they were so important and central to our peoples, um, what they mean to us as Indigenous women. It was really, really beautiful. And at one point, she mentioned that um, when she was preparing herself to carve her first kulik, she went to, she was invited to go to the Anchorage Museum into the archives where they have, they have our kuliks, they have our, our nanaks, our seal oil lamps. And she mentioned, because I was in this space, she mentioned that they had uh, one or two from Unlikely, from my home community. And I was so excited to hear that. I hadn't heard that before. And so I went on their website to see if I could somehow search or find an image of it so it could help provide inspiration for, for my own. And I couldn't find anything on there. And I mentioned before I have four kids. So you know how it is <laughs> just generally where you only have this set amount of time or this set amount of time to go and do something. I was like, oh, I have a little bit of time right now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run down there and see if I can look at it. So I went down to the museum 
and um, I was asking, how can I, how can I see the kula from Yunli? And the person at the front desk was really, um, it took me asking maybe three different times and ways for her to understand what I was asking for to see it. And then the response that I received was very, oh, you can't just walk in here and see that. I'm, I'm sorry, the, the, the person that you need to speak to who oversees, who oversees and protects these is not here. And here's their email address. Um, you can reach out to them and, and maybe set up a time. But it was very like, oh, you no, I'm sorry, you can't, you can't do that. And when I walked out of the museum, I cried. It was humiliating to have this yearning to be connected with something from my home in this awakening practice. And then to be made to feel like I didn't have a right. I didn't have a right to, to have access to it. Someone else had to decide when and where I could have access to that. And that was really painful. It was really painful. So that was a moment I had of realizing there really is a pretty huge disconnect that needs to be addressed so we can be in better relationship. Thank you for letting me share that. So I'll open it up and see if any of you have an experience you'd like to share of, of realizing the opportunities to grow in better relationship with Native people. I really appreciate you sharing that story. I think that's a beautiful story. Um, I think most of us who have worked with museum collections that come from Indigenous communities, we have the same story too. Pretty much all of us do, where we feel a strong desire to be connecting to our material belongings because they, they hold our stories, they're connected to our ancestors, they are part of us. They don't actually belong to any one museum, they belong to our communities and they are for us and they are meant to be, they are meant to be part of our everyday lives. And so when we are denied access, uh, it hurts and it, it's something that, it's something that does need to change. Um, I've had that experience. Uh, the, the first museum that I actually worked in as an employee before I was an employee there, um, and I'm not gonna say which museum that was, but I went to the museum. I was doing my graduate research on the Lutixukbiak masks. And I knew there were these incredible masks there and I had traveled pretty far to get to this museum and really just wanted to go see them. And I had let the curator know I was coming in advance and I was not given access either. But instead of, um, instead of uh, getting upset about that, what I did was I applied to work at that museum and I ended up getting a job there. And, and then I made some changes. And so what I think about doing whenever I see a museum that's doing something that I think is wrong, whether it's using the incorrect names for who we are or not attributing uh, cultural affiliation correctly, or if I see a museum not allowing access, I love being in this position of being able to step up and be an advocate and um, not, not even asking, but just saying, excuse me, we're gonna do things differently. And we can do that. And I'm not asking you as an individual, but I'm coming to you from all of my community surrounded or that surrounds and supports the work that we are doing. And we need to change things. And you know what? Most of the time museums listen and they want to make change, I see. And they're willing to, to do the work, I think, typically to, to start the process of changing. And I've seen that at very large institutions where sometimes it's easy and you can email a curator and you can say, hey, this thing happened, or I can see that you have the incorrect uh, 
word that you're using here, or you haven't done your background work to um, fact check to whatever label it is that you have up on your museum. So let's change this. Big museums, sometimes they turn right around and make that change. Sometimes it takes a lot of effort and work, but I think typically museums understand that uh, changes are needed and they are putting in that effort, I think. And I think it does require not individuals doing this alone. We have to work together and we have to have a support system when we go into large institutions that are not used to hearing indigenous people coming in and standing up for our rights. But we have this right and, um, and we can do this together. So I think, I think we have room for growth and I think changes are being made. Yeah, absolutely. So what I'm hearing you say, Nadia, is we just need to clone you so you can work at all these places. <laughs> or I'm happy to take people under my wing too. Yes. If, if something yes. happens and you, you, you need help getting access, I would love mm -hmm. to help you. I mean, little, little do they know, but everyone who's participating in this is, is doing that. <laughs> so good. Kleana Thought. Would like to go next. I could go next. Um, there's, I, th I think, one of the pieces to kind of. I I've been thinking about how to have the real conversation, knowing that I would consider many people on the Zoom friends and colleagues, and these are institutions that I also like collaborate with in multiple ways as an artist, as a like as a state employee, as like different ways. Um, what Nadia just started touching on, there the museum, a lot of museums tend to have some type of board. You have an, an executive who's overseeing it. And it's not just one person who's necessarily setting the cultural norms for that institution. It's stemming from a historical, this is the way that curiosity cabinets in the 1880s were made from extracting a lot of around the world indigenous objects that were interesting and putting them behind glass. And that's a very European white male privileged velvet smoking jacket salon kind of history. And that is really what museums are kind of predicated on conceptually. And then when there's a board and that kind of way of doing things can be hard to kind of crack and change. If that, the Asia touched on it a little bit too with like leadership matters. And I think that that's part of the challenge for museums is to realize that, and maybe if they don't know, I would say that a lot do know the power that they have, but using it as a way to answer the question, who is the museum for? And if the leadership decision-making and training and, and norms for how the institution actually functions is geared towards, this is for the people of Alaska, this is for indigenous people to be feeling like they belong. And it's not exclusively just for indigenous people, but if indigenous people don't belong and don't feel like they belong, it's not right. There's something off with that institution. And there's different levels of what that looks like and experiences of what that looks like. Uh, I think about in Alaska, we have a very strong tourism population that comes. And when the museums are geared towards what do tourists expect and want to see what Alaska is, whether it's Alaska's cold and it's the Arctic and there's polar bears and oil, and that's the takeaway, that doesn't create space where native people feel like they belong. And I could say that as I don't feel like I belong in that space might be an, a more appropriate way to say that. It's just a frequent conversation that we have within the artist community that I'm part of where it's these, it doesn't, that's not how we would represent ourselves. And when you have Alaska native working professionals in institutions saying that, it, and as a single voice, that's very challenging because your job's on the line. And as an independent artist, the museums hold a lot of power and privilege economically for you as an individual artist. 
And when you're raising that concern, the museum can blackball you. And then you have that, that problem, how do you do that? And what Nadia said about working together really is that strength that, that we need as, as Alaska Native people to navigate this and voice it. The other thing that from an institution level wise is the names of the institutions matter. And this isn't aimed at any, any specific person on the, on the Zoom or the works there, but the Sheldon Jackson Museum is as a museum named after a, a historical figure that did horrific things and is venerated by having a campus of what he did that still exists and is maintained to honor that individual. And it's just so yucky. Like he's responsible for so much horror and torturing of children. And we have like, an, um, there's amazing Alaska native materials in that museum and it's under the banner of this really awful historical figure. And it's a tricky thing when your museum is named after that person to, and I, the your is not, again, not aimed at an individual worker because um, it transcends time in, in any, it's the concept of why naming matters. And I think that there's some of that for just that needs to change and calling it out for what it actually is. And it's an opportunity to educate the public coming through there for what Sheldon Jackson actually did versus glorifying his legacy. So I'm, that's just a little bit of a bleh, kind of yucky stuff. <laughs> but I think that's, that's the challenge that we have for Native people going through that. That's not a place, those kinds of situations are not places for us because they're not designed for us. I don't, there's not a lot of Native people who are like, oh, yay, Sheldon Jackson did great stuff for boarding schools in Alaska. That's not the narrative in the Native community. So it's not a place for us. And I'm using that as a, as a targeted example because no one's decision has been used to like do Sheldon Jackson's actions. So again, not targeting any living individual, but that's a historical problem of an institution that goes beyond one living person. So Chanan for letting me kind of like, because it's just, yeah. it's yucky. Chanan for bringing that into our space, that realness. It's so true. I mean, when you provide a narrative of history that does not include the context of indigenous people's experience with it, you're contributing to erasure and it's irresponsible and it's violent. It's violent against native people because it just further feeds into the misperceptions about us. It feeds into a lack of understanding of the challenges that we experience in our community right now. It's harmful, it's deeply harmful to provide narratives of history that don't include Indigenous perspectives or context for that history. I'm really glad that you you brought that into our space. Um, and if I might say yeah, go more than don't include, that's basically, um, you know, heroicize um, the kind of trauma that um, is the, the heart of the colonial project. I mean, museums, um, in many ways represent the um, pedagogy of colonization, right? It's the um, categorization, collection, and ownership of objects. But the, the work today is of transforming museums into understanding their role as stewards and not as owners. And as um, to, make, to, to make a comparison, to think of it like a foster care system, for objects, you know, we, we really must transform the relationship, how these objects are tended and how they are made accessible to communities, just as we might have today better, um, you know, nobler interests with children or individuals, you know, who are moving through a system that was initially um, established to really 
control these objects. And, and so um, it, it's a, it's a very um, sticky place to be in museum leadership today because you've got to see yourself um, realistically as um, representing the colonial structure or its transformation. And being accountable to that in our state today means really leaning into um, community initiatives, collaboration, um, thinking about how your collections and how your workforce represents inclusion. So it's a whole cascade of change that needs to, you know, to come about. And at every level, um, people in the institution are gatekeepers for that. You know, it comes down to hosting the conversation, hosting um, and supporting access and creating opportunities for um, Indigenous communities and leaders to rise within these systems, lead them and change them. For me, a moment um, that was really kind of transformational is having dinner with Ron and Heidi Sanungatuk. And we started talking about um, an exhibition that was taking place in um, 2013 at Vassar College called Decolonizing the Exhibition, Contemporary Inuit Prints and Drawings from the Edward J. Guarino collection. And so students of um, art history at Vassar were given access to the collection and, to, and invited to create or sort of curate from that um, an image, you know, as curators will, an, a, a portrait in a sense of society or, or, or a moment in time. Um, and it was fascinating to see what they, lifted up in terms of self-representation. And um, Ron was very interested in this because many of you will remember that as um, an Inupiaq man, he made very clear that he was dedicated to um, great, making great work and learning and teaching and um, being a great artist. He didn't want to be categorized as a great native artist. He wanted to be recognized as a great artist in a, in a um, transcendent sense that wasn't like racially profiling, basically. And when he saw the objects that the students had selected from this collection, it was quite fascinating because they picked out objects that weren't on your stereotypical picture of nativeness so there were you know one woman had a pair of thick glasses and that and she and her drawing was of these glasses and the collection was like um objects of um, personal importance to probably all people today braziers glasses a lot of different things that people use and they were representing the, the students who who basically designed this exhibit created a, a very contemporary portrait of of native identity, if you will. And Ron said, um, you know, I think you should do something like that. You should do, you should create a show um, that attempts to um, reveal and support how artists are trying to decolonize within Alaska and to move away from perpetuating um, sellable and commercial images of native identity in a material way. And um, so that was that was the beginning for me, you know, of, of basically being challenged and being invited. And it was very important to me that that um, directive came from he and Heidi, really. Heidi had brought the article to dinner to show her dad and we're all talking about it. And he like looks at me and he's like, well, what, what can you do to kind of open this conversation in Alaska? I love that. Mm -hmm. For bringing that in. Um, I'll, I'll pull on one thread of what I heard from what you just shared, Asia, and then I'll see Jackie if, if you have anything you'd like to add as well. Um, you were talking about inclusion of Native people into these institutions and especially into leadership. And I, I do agree with you, absolutely. Um, I also think that experiences like what we're going through together right now are really vital 
so that we can grow shared understanding around the sensibility of being better relatives to Native people um, and not place, and, I, and I'm not saying that you were saying this, I'm just saying more generally, ensuring that we're not placing that burden on Native people individually to carry that for the institution. Um, one of the things that I think about when organizations and institutions are kind of grappling with how can we do a better job when it comes to working with Native or BIPOC peoples. Um, and usually one of the first things that they say is, oh, well, we need to hire more. And, and I understand that, but I'm always wondering, is your organization or institution a safe place for an Indigenous person? Or is it a place that's going to place an undue burden on this individual to carry the weight of ignorance that's in the institution itself? Um, Native people are not mules to carry the weight of others' ignorance about us. And so doing this hard work that we're doing right now of kind of like pulling pulling back the blinders so that we can all see more clearly how we can be better relatives is really key. So I really appreciate you bringing that forward. Jackie, are you there? Do you have an experience you'd like to share with us? Yes, Royana, I'm here. So um, something that came to mind after hearing, you know, your past stories and experiences. Um, in 2008, I was in Europe kind of touring museums and um, a museum in Paris we visited. I checked if there was anything Yupik in their collection. Um, and I just so happened to find the only Yupik piece there was a mask from here, my hometown of Gwynhok, which I thought was, you know, completely wild. And of course, I mean, I wished I could bring it back home. And I wondered, you know, why, what is it doing halfway around the world? And, you know, we don't even know about it. Um, so that was, I mean, maybe when I, when I realized the impact it had with uh, the, just the separation of this one piece to myself um, being halfway around the world. So that's just a um, ex kind of one of the experiences I wanted to share. And then um, most of most of the experience um, that local natives have had in Gwynhak today with with Nunasuk um, is nothing close to my experience in 2008 in Paris. In fact, um, our situation is kind of one of its kind where the whole repository is, is here now locally, um, you know, public domain for anyone to see. And we're, um, the last I checked, we're at 100,000 pieces um, just from Nunasak, the old village. And um, as some of you know, it's one thing, you know, the community struggled with is the fact that um, digging ceremonial artifacts or, or graves is of course taboo to many indigenous cultures. So um, when people started finding artifacts um, due to the, cult uh, the cultural erosion happening here, um, the communities realized they were losing um, all the, you know, all the history that comes with connecting these artifacts with who we are. And so in 2009-ish, I believe, is when I first saw the archaeology team um, from Aberdeen. They came here and they did a, you know, a small excavation um, in 2009. And I remember um, just assuming maybe because of what Native people have um, for relationship with museums in the past, um, and the fact that um, 
you know, artifacts don't generally come back to their original environment. I guess I had assumed these people <laughs> were here like handling our ceremonial pieces and um, and I think I assumed we weren't welcome to be a part of it. So I kept myself like kind of separated from them and kind of like waited to see like, when are we gonna be able to be a part of this? And I guess like in the end, I was completely wrong about it all because um, like I said, right now we are, this is the first um, repository of its kind in the region with artifacts located in their natural and original environment um, and managed by the same people whose story they represent. So we are part of the decision-making process. As I said, I'm, I'm actually not co-chair and vice chair of the Quinhawk Heritage Inc. Um, and everyone there is local except for one um, lead archeologist from Aberdeen. And maybe this can be the example of how, you know, how to bridge um, once so separated groups and um, let's see. And then the fact that the presence of the artifacts in Gwynhawk are tangible connections to the Yupik culture. Um, I think it's a great tool for just the younger generation to learn and appreciate more of who they are. And in fact, you know, um, based on, I mean, just the trickling effect was of right now they, I mean, since the artifacts have been unearthed, um, there's just been this explosion of cultural revitalization among our young people who seem to be um, a lot more proud of who they are. And they've even started a dance group themselves and um, practice at the museum here. And they're really, they're so good. They brought me to tears before. <laughs> and so um, maybe I'll stop there because there's other questions to come. <laughs> so good, Jackie. Yeah, of course there's this explosion of pride that flows from that. You know, I really, just speaking to our Native family here, you know that feeling that you get when you hear a truth from our people or a teaching from our people that you haven't heard before, but you know, and your scalp tingles and your heart beats a little bit faster and you start to feel really warm. I feel like those moments are the knowledge that's already within us waking up. That's what it feels like for me. And Jackie, as you were just expressing that, I mean, I've, I've looked, I've gotten to see some of the, um, the objects that have resurfaced through that project and just absolutely beautiful and inspiring. And I can see the sense of connection to, um, to the, these beautiful ceremonial objects. So I do think that that's really wonderful. And you led us just perfectly into the next question that I wanted to, to ask our crew here. And that is, if you could in an instant change one practice, that currently exists in our museums when it comes to working with native people or um, shaping the narrative of native people's cultures, histories, whatever that might be. What is something that you would want to see changed that could transform the way that we have our relationships? I don't think I have a brilliant response to that right now, but. I do want to build upon what Jackie was saying about the importance of having 
archaeological pieces available for our youth to be able to see and experience um, within our own communities. And I would just say, uh, as somebody who's from Cashmac Bay area, uh, we have very few of our historical Cashmac Bay materials available in our own community because so many of them were excavated and removed from our communities and taken really far away. So some of the best collections from Cashmac Bay in particular are located in the Penn Museum currently where they're listed as Eskimo and they're sitting in these storage areas that are dark and unvisited and they don't get to be loved and they don't get to be part of our children's lives and they don't get to be, they don't get to be seen and experienced and they don't fall under NAGPRA so they they don't have this experience of getting to come back home and to be in the environment where they were born and where they where they really should be. Um, I had an opportunity to bring my daughters to visit uh, collections, and my oldest daughter was with me, um, and we got to see some uh, earrings that were made in a from a historical context. Um, and we were in New York City, and she's like why are these here? These are so amazing. These are so beautiful. And uh, I just want her to be able to have that experience like every day. And I want those to be in our, in our home area. And so I guess if I could change something, I would let our things come home. Not if they're only NAGPRA sensitive as, um, as is legally allowed, but I would say, let's bring our things home. Let's talk to museums like University of Pennsylvania or wherever else our things are held. And let's open up these conversations and say, thank you for caring for our material belongings. Thank you for making sure they were safe. And you know what? We're ready to have them come back home now. And we, we know how to do this. We know how to take care of them. Um, the Nunothic Center is a great example to, to be able to share that it can be done uh, safely and um, that it's very important for our our youth and for our elders to be able to have that connection. So that's something that I dream about and I hope I can see happen in my lifetime. Yeah. We, we have a, a webinar coming up on repatriation. Um, and I know that's gonna be part of the conversation as well, but maybe um, I'll just plant a seed, a question for folks to be thinking about because I, I can only imagine having had these conversations with museum professionals in the past, the sense of panic, the sense of anxiety of, oh my gosh, what if we give these items back and um, they're not able to care for them in the way that only we know how kind of sense. So planting a seed of a question, what assumptions are you making about what is the right way to care for these objects, to protect them. Is protection um, keeping them pristine or is protection keeping them in use? You know, just challenging some assumptions that we make when it comes to making those kinds of decisions. All right, Joel or Asia, either of you wanna hop in? I'll jump in. Um, it's a similar kind of flow of if these objects were considered relatives or alive, would they be treated differently? And what, like, I put down like a note when we were, when I was listening about the, like our material culture is, it's a living part that is in relationship with like our our we live with it that's that's our art we we don't remove it from ourselves and put it on the wall behind glass like our our art is on our clothes we it's the it's the material culture part of us is our fine art and i th i think that's one of the the, the shifts is it in the, in the magic wand changing something would be that mindset that our material culture is categorized in the same way that Western fine arts defines art. And as someone who like makes bronze life statuary, figurative, classic Greco-Roman styled people, that's like the apex of 
Western art in the sculpture world is that bronze human being. And it's like that same amount of care or validation or those kinds of attitudes around that, if that was the same amount of respect that was in authority to define what we call art, um, would change it from, in some ways, a commodity into this is something that needs to be lived with and respected as a living entity. And that is part of the museum thread. It's, it's a interesting, to me, it's an interesting tidbit of art is one of a very few types of commodities that is unregulated for investment. So it's, it's definitely, there's a relationship of money to art and there's a power and privilege. And not that our people haven't been bought and sold before and our bones collected, but changing the attitude about how you, tr like considering that these are alive and maybe if I can have a second magic wand wish, how the, how the institutions teach or treat living people would need to shift because the way that living people are treated isn't necessarily, has not been the best. So <laughs> defining our art as living and then treating them as bad as they treated the living people isn't gonna fix it. So it's kind of a twofer, They're, it's an and statement. So it, there, that, that's kind of my, my thought around that. Um, when we consider that there's entire basements filled with human bones, like, Th those are living people and that's the practice that was done so it, like the amount of work that it takes to change that mindset and then changing the mindset around our material objects as living beings is just part of that that piece that's connected Chanan. Chanan, truth i mean part of what i feel you're you're speaking to is the work of museums to resensitize to our humanity. You know, the bones of our ancestors. Do you think differently about them if you imagine them as the bones of your child or your parent or yourself? You know, as an institution, as a system, we have been commodified for so long that there is a desensitization to our humanity. And that's a big part of the work that needs to shift is seeing us as a relative, not just a relative, a precious relative. Asia? Thank you. Yeah. I mean, having um, built um, collections out of a out of a colonial model of of ownership and um, extraction, museums are in a difficult position, but really an opportunity to transform um, through learning and representing um, indigenous values, basically a different wealth model, a model that isn't based on narrowing the access or um, imposing a value system, but rather creating a system, reinventing a system around access and sharing, like that the, the capacity of that institution to be generous, to provide access, to be maybe more like a library. And I'm not saying that everything leaves. I love and completely support the idea of things going to their home communities. But what if the museum transformed into a space where uh, as like a place of learning where it sees itself as belonging to a community and having the responsibility to um, invite community to interpret and hold and care for objects. I'm, I'm reminded of a story that Melissa Shaganoff tells about taking some 
traditional objects um, to villages, objects that were actually in need of repair. And in the hands of elders, immediately people started to work on them and repair them. And it was like, wait a minute, we need to have our conservators, you know, like managing this process. And that was really fascinating ironic and ultimately kind of tragic because it speaks to where the power lies and the control lies. But what if that kind of opportunity were actually instead celebrated and there were intergenerational groups um, witnessing and observing and asking questions in that process. So the museum is like that learning place where this kind of repatriation and education and repair work happens that really we understand decolonization as a recovery process. It's a process of recovering power, recovering access, recovering dignity and education that's facilitated by the museum. Yeah, absolutely. And celebrating the living knowledge, right? Totally made me think of, um, you know, our, our CEO, Laguna Liz Medicine Pro will share um, from her uncle, Norman Jackson. You know, he would talk about the romanticizing of the concept traditional and how, you know, as an artist, imposing an idea of what is considered traditional or not traditional is, is harmful to the artists, especially as indigenous peoples, we've always been adaptive and evolving peoples and traditional and modern are not mutually exclusive. But he would talk about how, you know, when people would challenge um, whether or not he, he was doing something traditionally, he would say, you're going to have to tell me at what point in our, our past traditional ended. Right. At what point did what is considered traditional end? Because what you're asking me to do as an artist is to then practice a dying art or a dead art because it's no longer evolving and continuing. And so that's another um, aspect of growth that I think can absolutely continue to happen. I do see it happening. Um, in different ways in our museums where it allows for our continued evolution and our continued growth and our continued adaptation and everything, innovation, you know, our creativity and all the ways that we express that as modern Native peoples. Um, and not romanticizing, like, or perpetuating, um, perpetuating messages that are harmful. Like you have to be traditional in this way to be more native, right? Feeding into what is more or less native and those kinds of things. There's all kinds of ways subtly that you can carry those messages even without um, intending to. So I think one thing um, that I would do with my, my magic wand, I didn't pre-think this out, so this just popped into my mind, but You know, uh, a couple of years ago, I pursued my master's through UAF in large part because I was already doing research about the history of missionization and the education um, formation in my community in Ungalachlik. And I kept bumping into barriers of accessing interviews and accessing papers and research and publications that had been done in my community where that information, which is from my community, had been privileged into UAF. And you could only access it as a student or someone who worked there. And so I did end up kind of like what Nadia was saying. I, I just went and worked there so that I can then have access and do the thing, right? I kind of did that. I, I signed up for my master's so that it would have full access. And then in my thesis wrote about how incredibly messed up it is to have to pay the system that was complicit in removing your knowledge to try and reclaim it. 
how many times over do Native people have to pay? Mm -hmm. Right? So thinking about that has me thinking about museums. Native people shouldn't have to pay to have access. Mm -hmm. We just shouldn't. How many times and ways should we have to pay for what's been taken from us, right? At least in this time. And I run this by anyone. This is not an official FAI. We should do this kind of thing. That was just something that popped into my head, right? I don't think that we should have to pay to have access to the things that have been taken from us and continue to be taken from us, right? They're privileged into institutions. Okay, so as we are rounding the final lap of our time together, I just want to open it up um, to each of you to share anything that's on your heart. You know, we've got folks who are working in these institutions and are really um, open and wanting to learn and grow and, and think through how they can be change agents in these institutions. How can museums better reflect a place of belonging for all people? How can they, um, how can they be better relatives to the indigenous communities that they serve as well? So I'll just open it up for you guys to each share any closing thoughts that you may have. I think we can be good relatives when we're good listeners and when we come to communities without, uh, without an agenda, when you just, when you come and you be your true and authentic self and you, um, you are welcoming and you are making space for people to share their stories on their, on their, in whatever way is most comfortable for how people would like to share their stories. It's often been the case that within our communities, museums already have an idea about who we are and what we do, and the museums already have an idea about what they want to see come out of um, discussions or conversations. So sometimes they come to a community with an idea about what an exhi exhibit they want to plan will look like and who they want to involve, rather than just beginning a conversation by asking a community, what do you want? What would you like to see happen? Um, so I would like to invite museums to, uh, to visit with our communities with an open mind and to recognize that Alaska Native people are experts in our own cultural histories and that we are very passionate people and we have our own stories to tell. Um, and we, we need space and we need, um, we need time to be able to tell those stories and bring out our own stories on our own terms. I might have something else I want to share, but that's that's just where I would start that. I think there's such, um, you know, remarkable leadership just like surrounding me in this conversation. I, I look at First Alaskans Institute. I look at um, the Siri Foundation and Nadia's role there and uh, Joel's work um, as an artist and educator, many of the other folks who Jackie, the folks who are in this panel, yourself, Ayu, but who have been on um, the panels that are part of this bigger project. And I would love to see museums asking, what can we, how can we do better? What initiatives do you see that we can support? What opportunities for um, learning and training? I mean, any good teacher really sees themselves as a student and um, that's a, a tremendous opportunity within the sort of brain trust in Alaska today is to lean into the leadership and the ideas that are here, the initiatives. There's, there's funding that um, many of these leaders and entities know about that could help museums to grow and support um, opportunity for access and um, empowerment of indigenous leaders and communities. I'll go next. Thanks, Asia. I wanted to maybe I'm not exactly sure what I'm responding to um, when you talked before, but some something you said made me think of our digital museum. And at first we were um, <clears throat> kind of worried of like, um, 
getting an audience besides their own local people and maybe some um, some visitors that come, but um, because we have all these, you know, 60 plus thousand in our museum here, but it's in a little village at the, you know, edge of the, um, along the Bering Sea coast. So one way that it is going out to a broader audience is through the digital museum and and it's kind of um, interactive you know you click on an object or an artifact and then it there's a little video clip some of which i've shot <laughs> and um little video clip of an interview with an expert um say harpoon expert um will be interviewed and you could watch their video and then there's <clears throat> Um, 3D imaging of the object, descriptions, um, some animation. It's just a multimedia of um, a really good com communication to um, way to get get it all out um, in a good interactive way that um, engages all ages. I would say. <clears throat> um, another thing I, I'll maybe finish with is. Um, going back to the magic wand and um, how I've always wanted to, I mean, I'm sure we've all wanted Indigenous knowledge and Western science to be more collaborative. And it is interesting in this, um, in the museum aspect, I guess, between Indigenous knowledge and archaeology. And um, for instance, uh, Yupik ways of being are um, ontologies, I guess. I mean, it's different to the Western science culture where all the whys are answered in, in Western science. All the whys are usually answered. But part of being Yupik is just knowing that, just knowing and not asking why. <laughs> because some of that is tied to traditional or indigenous knowledge and all the stories for the teachings. It's a style of um, teaching, I guess, from our upbringing traditionally. And if um, archeology span is to be relevant in a Yupik context, it needs to be aware of this and allow for more collaborative and open-minded or sorry, open-ended relationship with the past. Um, and that's probably probably why it resonated so clearly with younger generations here, um, because maybe there it's you know easier for them to reconcile these different cultural traditions, if that makes sense. <laughs> How about you, Joel? Um, there's, I think a really short way of saying it is that museums need to hold themselves accountable. And if there's leadership that's in place, that's part of the problem, that leadership needs to change and not like when they retire and slowly under the rug slipping into the night, it's like, nope, it's done. Restart. And it's, it really, it can be done. And I think that that's like there, this is not necessarily easy work. There's a certain level, um, some might call it bravery or courage that it takes. It might also just be like, that's the work. It's, it's not easy work to, to hold a mirror up when you know that what you're gonna see is not great and you have to be the one holding the mirror and staying in front of it to see the change that needs to happen. But that's really what it takes um, to, to have some of that, some of that institutional change. And to not just try and like, oh, we're going to incrementally shift this over the next 75 years. Like that, that's not a, that's not real change. That's just the system maintaining itself. Um, I think the other ways that museums could, could help be good relatives is um, advocating similar to, I would say, but Jackie shared kind of reminded me of one of the conversations early on when that, the website for the their cultural center was was being developed and one of the conversations around it was the way that that the people are visualized and an initial version had like 
kind of the, the savage looking hair where it's like messy people. And it's like our, our hair, like we've been very particular about our hair as indigenous people for thousands of years. We're not disheveled dances with wolves, cave people who didn't, didn't know how to wash. Like we didn't have all the sicknesses until colonialism brought them. Like, how did we do that? Like, well, we were really clean. Our practices, our ceremonies kept us from getting sick in that way. We, we knew how to like, so just visualizing as I feel like I have a crazy messy hair day myself, but it's just like, we're not just disheveled looking people. And the shift from how we as indigenous people are visualized, especially since museums deal with visual content is something that they play a huge role in. And that indigenous people should be driving that representation not as a, oh, we had an exhibit, exhibit go up and we're getting some heat in the press. We, we were gonna pull together a committee to kind of look at how we might tweak the, the titles. It's like, that's not change, that's reaction. Change is the, what other people have said from the beginning, having those conversations about what kinds of spaces, what kinds of stories are native people wanting to tell. And from an academic standpoint, I think this is one of the uh, issues with STEM education models, where in order for it to be science, it has to be like a 3D printer and it has to be like all the, the different ways that Western science does engineering. And when we do cultural teaching of science pieces, it's getting, it's losing its soul. It's, it's losing the living part of our culture oftentimes by the outcome being driven that the students are are learning science through a western style rather than letting the material culture drive the the just the science and the learning piece and so there's some there's some power that muse i think museums could kind of flex on to help with defining what those terms are and, and what they look like in action, that that piece of the conservation being elders sewing things and fixing things is an example of that, where it's like, well, that's, that's what you do with this. And it might be that maybe the elders don't have access to really snazzy archival materials. So that's what's brought to the sewing table and the elders can just pick it up. They know how to, to thread a needle. And if they don't have the, the right um, materials to do that kind of work, provide that and then just get out of the way. Um, so I, I think that's, that's just kind of some of the, the, the pieces with it um, around what museums could, could be doing um, to be good relatives in that way. Yeah. There's one more piece that I would like to bring up. And I think that looking at a bigger um, context across, um, you know, what is now called the United States, um, Great Britain and Europe, um, but especially in the United States in light of the um, ongoing social justice work that's really come to light um, through the pandemic with real systemic inequities that museums in particular are maintaining. And it's a, it's a range of things that have to do with um, uh, huge wage disparity at the lowest levels of workforce to the highest levels of workforce and, and great um, disparity in access within communities to what kinds, you know, who, who's on the boards, how diverse are those boards, how indigenous are these boards in Alaska? That must be addressed. And what about community advisory input that helps steer the content of the exhibitions, that helps reflect and represent and empower and strengthen communities? There's so much work to be done. And we're seeing museums across our country become more accountable to that. And Alaska is as, um, as much a part of this problem as it can be a part of the solution. What I think that we have here that's so special in our state is um, a great deal of connectivity, a great deal of dedication, a great deal of passion, 
a lot of economic resources on the level of on foundations and organization to help address the problem. And I'd like to see museums consciously lean into it and say, this is work that we need to do. And we can do it through empowering our communities, drawing in indigenous advisors and leaders from artists to business people and educators to say what, what work needs to be done and um, who wants to help us address it and what sort of themes do we need to surface. But museums will otherwise continue to silo themselves as people, you know, um, think in terms of historical models of what curatorship means and what um, excellence means. I mean, it doesn't, if you just look around at um, museums in Alaska and look at who's on their boards and who's leading, it, it shows you they're not integrated enough. They're not di diverse enough. And so there's work to be done. Absolutely. You reminded me, Asia, thank you for sharing that, that part of this call, if you're, if you're going to be walking this path, and I do hope that everyone is, that you concurrently are called to grow in language around anti-racism, that you're going to have to prepare yourself to help others understand why this is so important and that equality and equity are not the same thing. That's not the time that we're living in. Taking an equality of treating everyone the same right now will continue to perpetuate racist outcomes. And to be effective at this work, you know, arming ourselves with the knowledge and the language of how to talk about it and why this is the direction we need to go is part of the work. Um, yeah, so much of what's been said, I absolutely resonate with. You know, Joel, when you were talking about holding up the mirror, it reminded me of a way that I always visualize this time that we're in right now and coming to understand our history as it's been told through the eyes of people who did not love us in the education system, those who had privilege and access to write about us and museums and the media, those who have the privilege and power to shape narratives about people. That in so many ways as a native person, it's been like we've been gazing into a painted mirror for generations. And it's a mirror that was painted by people who did not love or truly understand us. And we're in this process now as native people of trying to wipe that mirror clean, to actually see ourselves and reclaim our, our birthright, our knowledge. And partnership with museums and educational institutions and all of these is an important part of that puzzle, that very complex puzzle that we're navigating through right now. Um, one thought that I wanted to add to the conversation um, as well is, you know, um, Jackie, when you were talking about Nunafluk and your the digital archive, it reminded me of an experience I had as a as a student when I was trying to do more research. Is that our our knowledge, our our pieces, our objects, recordings, they are so spread out over the entire planet it's really difficult to know who has what. And finding a way, I think in the interim, at a bare minimum, what museums um, and other repository type institutions need to do is to reach out to communities to inform them, we have these items that are from your area. Um, and find a way for them to become accessible. Because otherwise, it's it, it's hard to describe how overwhelming it is to know that so much of the knowledge that you're seeking as a Native person is siloed into all of these institutions that have their own gatekeepers, that have their own ways of accessing it or not. And so 
shifting that tide so that the information flows to community instead of individual community members trying to seek it out, I think is one important thing that needs to happen. Um, a related thought that I think will will fit as the series continues to roll out is around truth telling about our history. We were just in a convening last week about boarding school research where people who are focused on different aspects of research about our boarding school history came together and were giving presentations about their research. And just in that period of time of listening to these individuals that have been doing this hard work, some of them for decades, they were able to start filling in all of these gaps that each other had been running into because they had access to different information. And so I was thinking, you know, when it comes to telling the truth about the history of boarding schools, as one example, in Alaska, what would it look like to issue a call to all institutions that have in their care items that help tell that history, all of it, so that we can have a more fully informed understanding of this history? You know, what would that look like? And it, it could be on any given topic. But it's one that's exciting for me to think about. Like, what does it look like to, to Wonder Twin Powers, you know, share what we have that's available? So in that spirit, we have just a few minutes left. Um, I just want to take advantage of the wealth of knowledge that's in this group right here and ask if, if there are any resources you could point to that could help others to learn more about growing their relationship with Native people. Um, you're welcome to, to toss links into the chat uh, for those who are um, here in the, the Zoom with us, but it would be good for you to also speak it out loud so that those who watch the recording later can also look it up. One example I can think of, um, Nadia, you had written a recent blog post on Arctic Art Summit. Um, what is Alaska Native Museum Sovereignty? That's a great um, resource. What are other resources that you guys can point to that can help those who are listening in just continue growing on this journey? What has helped you? I think um, in a the National Indian Education Association has like a guideline for how to do meaningful tribal consultation. And it's geared more towards education, but I think it's very relevant to like how do how does any institution and museums have often educational tilts um, engage with tribes and how to how to do that respectfully. The other is the National Museum of American Indian, um, NMAI, um, does, has I'll put their web page in, in the chat too, but that's an, another one that can sometimes um, help with either webinars that they've hosted or actual um, guides that they may put out occasionally. If you haven't already looked at the School of Advanced Research Guidelines for Collaboration, that's an amazing resource that gives recommendations for museums to think about how to work with community members along with case studies. Um, and I would just share that um, the Siri Foundation is in the process of creating this guidebook that we hope to have done later in the fall, which will include a chapter by Joel, um, as well as a bunch of other really brilliant people uh, sharing about their experiences in museums. So we hope that's something that everyone on this discussion will read and uh, pay attention to. Um, and then I would also point out that the Alutic Museum has a really great um, database that they're working on putting together about um, trying to map out where different Alutic collections are around the world. And I don't know that I would be able to pronounce it correctly, but I'll try to put that in the chat box too. But I think it's a really beautiful opportunity to see how um, how how far across the world Alutic belongings are being currently held and what the Alutic Museum is putting together, I think is really impressive and amazing. So I would check that out too. Awesome, just put in the chat something from Asia. What are ways that indigenous cultural authority can be centered for decolonial futures? 
there's a link to a video on Vimeo. Um, something that I, I passed in the chat as well, Coera within the last several years um, has been doing work around knowledge sovereignty and the indigenization of knowledge, um, building from the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, and so they've created some guides that help those who are conducting research in all of its forms in our communities to be in better relationship with our tribes and with our native peoples. There's also just um, a, um, a number of workshops that are ongoing and taking place. I just completed an eight month module with Emily Johnson and Renee Pinoy, um, First Nations people, First Nations performing arts. And it applies really to all presenters about decolonizing practices and leaning into indigenous cultural authority. And it addresses everything from issues of copyright and language, um, you know, when to use quotations and italics, how are you centering indigenous authority and what what strategies are available? And I think that it's a time as leaders to see oneself as a student and to just really say, hey, our whole field is doing this. I can be a part of learning too. I can take pride <laughs> in learning, you know, um, techniques for transition. Awesome. Love it. Thank for letting us do a quick crowdsource <laughs> while we had you. Um, I just want to say to our presenters. Thank you so much for setting aside time. Some of you had to make some big shifts to your schedule to make it so you could be here. And I just am so thankful that you did. It's been such a rich conversation. I'm really looking forward to um, the ways that these seeds will grow into really fruitful conversations about how we can continue to transform institutions to be better relatives to Native peoples and by extension, be better place for all. You know, we believe that what's best for Alaska Native people is best for all. We are inclusive by nature. And we just want to really acknowledge that and lift each of you up. So, Kleanapak, so much for taking your time with us.